Well, we're glad you're here, and if you're joining us online, we're glad you're joining us online. Anybody heading down to Stampede this week? I see one cowboy hat. Anybody else going down? Yeah? Yeah, a stampede will be fun. It'll be packed with people and a little bit of uh, excitement around you that will move you forward in life, I hope. Um, how many of you have ever faced an adversity in your life and not known what to do? Anybody been overcome by something that came your way and you were just like, man, how do I move forward in this? Anybody ever been there? I've been there a couple times uh, in my life. Uh, when we were planting a church down in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, uh, Andrea and I were down there uh, about 13 years ago when we were planting that church. Uh, we had a challenge in the church, and uh, we had some people that you know got upset about some things. We made some changes, and <clears throat> we moved from Saturday nights, <clears throat> excuse me, from Saturday night services to Sunday morning services. And we had planted the church on Saturday evenings uh, because. A lot of the people that were going to help us plant the church were still attending the church that they were part of. And we were like, oh, that's fine. We just need help. That'd be great if you want to help us on Saturday night. Uh, that would be awesome. Go back to your church on Sunday. Be committed there. Be part of that church. So as the church began to grow and we built our building and we got into our facility, we got to the point of where Saturday night was more of a challenge than a benefit. Now, I, I thought Saturday night, and for, for me, just, just, you know, a little inside. For me, going to church on Saturday night means you have all day Sunday off. You really get a full Sabbath, right? You can relax all day long. So for me, going to church on Saturday night, I thought, every, why isn't everybody doing this? Like you work all, all week long. Saturday, you're busy. And then Five o'clock or so, you go, you know, let's get cleaned up. Let's go to church and worship. You go to church and worship on Saturday night. And then Sunday, you actually really get to relax. So, I mean, for me, I think Saturday night would be the place, the place is packed. Not so much. And not so much when you're planting a new church. And so as we planted this church and got it going, you know, Saturday night was doing okay. And it was getting some traction. And we were reaching some new people. And, and it came to the point that we thought, you know what? We need to move this to Sunday morning. I was talking to some of the individuals that, uh, from the district that were helping us do this and, and counselors and, and well, I shouldn't say counselors, coaches that were helping us do it and everything. And they said, you know what, Mark, you're, I mean, we, we applaud you for what you're doing, but you're kind of working against the grain. Why don't you just go Sunday morning? You're in Texas, man. This is the South and everybody goes to church on Sunday. I said, all right, let's make the shift. So we make the shift and we go to Sunday. Of course, we lose a lot of people that have been helping us from other churches and we bless them. We said, thank you for helping us out. You've been a blessing to us. We understand you're committed there too. Go back there. But it left us in a situation of where, well, what do we do now? We've just lost a lot of our workforce. And so Andrea and I, literally, we just began to pray and we were literally going to the front of the church every morning, early in the morning, and we'd pray for about an hour. And we'd just say, God, we need your wisdom. We need your direction. We need, we need you to sort through this circumstance. Uh, I think it was on Wednesday, my, uh, the guy that was in charge of church planting for the North Texas District calls me. And uh, Nova calls me and he says, hey, Mark, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, I don't know. You tell me. You're my boss. And uh, he said, well, I need you to be at the university tomorrow morning because I'm preaching in chapel. And I said, okay, great. What do you need me to do? He said, I just need you to come up at the end of my sermon, and you are basically going to be my altar call. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm preaching on fulfilling God's call in your life. And this was right in September, the beginning of the year, and we had relaunched you know, the church in the Sunday mornings. And, and he said, I'm preaching on the call of God in your life. And this is at Southwestern uh, Summers of God School. And he said, you and another church planter are going to be my altar call in that does anybody feel God leading them to take and commit a year to help plant a church? And I said, dude, I'm there. Anything else you want me to do? So we went. We were there. He calls us up at the end of the service. Twelve young adults that were in Bible college studying to, for ministry or studying for education or other things all felt the Holy Spirit speak into their heart to come forward, and they stood beside us, and they took over everything in the church and moved it forward. It was just a God thing. Like I couldn't do that on my own. 
I, I could not go get 12 workers that would volunteer their time and step right in and take up every piece that needed to be picked up impossible. And I hadn't even talked to Nova about it. I hadn't said, dude, this is where I'm at. This is what's going on. I mean, he, he knew everything was going on in the church. He knew the transition we were making because he's one of the guys that said, you need to make this transition and, and all of this stuff. But man, when God did that, like we didn't know if anybody was going to come to the front. I mean, these are university students. They're pretty busy as it is, but 12 of them came forward. There was people for children's ministry. There was people for, for worship ministry. There was people to open the building and lock the building. There was people to work in the coffee shop. I mean, it was just, it was amazing. But it was a total God thing. But Andrea and I, when, when we knew we were making this change and all of this was happening, we just said, okay, God, we know you've told us to do this. This just got incredibly hard because of the change we're making this is going to be even harder than it was before. You've got to show up in a big way. And God did. And sometimes when you face adversity, or actually all the time when you face adversity, I encourage you, you've got to stop and say, okay, God, where are you in the middle of this? Where are you in the middle of this? We see this in Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 17, we see Paul face incredible adversity. Now, if you're you know, coming this weekend and you thought, oh, I thought we were in Acts chapter 17. We're going to deal with that one next week. Uh, Brandon's going to deal with that. Uh, I just had planned to do this one, and uh, so we're, we switched it up a little bit. So uh, we're going to deal with Acts 18 this weekend. So Paul faces incredible adversity in Corinth. And when you read through this passage of Scripture, you think, well, yeah, I mean, it just it works out okay, and it all works good. But if you look at Corinthians, and you read Corinthians, even 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you start to read 1 Corinthians, you understand that there actually became a great move of God in the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church actually even had to be corrected by Paul in his letter to him saying, hey, you're getting a little bit crazy in the gifts of the Spirit, guys. Here's the important things in worship. Here's what needs to happen. And, 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 he, and he gives correction to them and, and encouragement to them and how to use the gifts of the Spirit in a wise way. So the Corinthian church was actually very important as we move forward. Paul's in the Corinthian church, and when he's there, the individuals and the Jewish leaders rise up against him. One Jewish leader, synagogue leader, gets saved, and he begins to follow Jesus, and, and then he transitions out, and another Jewish leader comes in, and, and he literally rises up against Paul and brings Paul, and I'm going to give you a picture of this, then we'll go into the scripture, brings Paul before the proconsul, who's in charge of the entire area for the Roman uh, government, as it were, and that basically, when he brings him to him, this guy says, man, this is your own problem. This isn't my problem. And he, they tell him to deal with it yourself. And that individual ends up getting beat up by a mob that was there. God walks through this with, with Paul. And in this case, Paul didn't even have to say a word. He didn't have to do anything. He just allowed God to work on his behalf. So when we jump into this, we look at Acts chapter 18. And it says, when Silas and Timothy came uh, from Macedonia, uh, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching and testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul, he became and became abusive. He shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood is on your own hands. And I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Paul's in the synagogues and he's teaching and all of a sudden they, they start rising up against him. And Paul basically does this symbol of shaking the dust off. And we know Jesus says, when you go, when Jesus told his disciples, when you go into a town and they don't receive your message, just shake the dust off and go on, right? So Paul, in this case, he goes into a town, he goes into the synagogues, he's teaching there and they reject him. And when they reject him, he basically shakes the dust off and says, that's all right. If you won't receive what God wants to say, it's not going to stop me from talking about who Jesus is. And literally, literally, Paul moves forward in this courage that God has still got something in store for him to do. When you face adversity, when you come up against something, you're like, man, why is this happening? Why is this coming at me? you got to have courage to go forward. 
If you don't have courage to go forward, you're going to get stuck. You're, you're going to kind of you know, sneak away, you're, whatever it might be. But if God has called you to do something, and this might even be in your own workplace. This might be in your secular workplace where you know there's something that needs to be done in your business or needs to be done in your workplace, and you feel, i got to go this way, and you get opposition against it. Well, in those cases, you need to be able to shake it off. And one thing that you see here in Paul is he doesn't take offense, as it were, and go, oh, well, if this town isn't going to receive it, I'm going to go to the next town. He knows God has called him to that town. And it wasn't a, let me get out of this place. It was a, okay, God, you've called me here. I'm going to move forward in this. If somebody in your workplace tells you, no, I don't like your idea, you can't just go, well, I quit right? That wasn't what Paul was doing. He was in his mind and visibly he was saying, okay, you're not receiving it, but I'm going to keep moving forward because I know this needs to happen. If you're a leader in a workplace and you get opposition, you need to test it, see what's going on. But sometimes you need to just go, okay, that's all right. We're moving forward. We're moving forward because I know this needs to happen. Paul does this. He has courage to move forward. And then Paul looks for an open door. And I think this is key, especially if you feel you're being led by the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. But if you know God has called you to do something and there's opposition that comes your way, God will open another door. I, I've seen it in my own life. It happened to me when we were planting that church. I mean, it was, it was a major change we were making. We knew that. We knew that there was going to be opposition to that. We knew all of that stuff, but we knew that's what God was telling us to do. And when we made that decision, we just began to pray. And within a couple of days, I got a call for an open door. It's, it's, it's like God saying, all right, you took a step in faith. Now let me open the door to show you where you're going. And this happens to Paul, literally. <laughs> if you read the scripture, Paul, Paul shakes the dust off as he leaves the, the synagogue. And next door, the guy opens his house. So the same people that would have been coming to the synagogue to listen to him still just came to the synagogue. They just passed the synagogue door and went in the neighbor's door. And God, and God used that for Paul to be able to continue to bring the gospel message forward in Corinth. As Paul goes forward and into this new door and this new opportunity, he has both Jews and Gentiles that come to him. Not just the Jews in the synagogue, but the Jews and Gentiles. As he goes forward, God begins to open up new doors for him. One night, it says this, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. Okay, so the Holy Spirit had led Paul there. And Holy Spirit had been directing Paul. And Paul was being open to what the Holy Spirit was saying. And he was moving forward in faith. And God was opening doors. And all of a sudden, he gets this vision where Jesus comes to him and says, Paul, don't be afraid of what's going to happen. Now, at that point, I'd be a little bit discouraged, too, because now all of a sudden, I know something's going to happen. Right? He's like, oh, man. And Paul, I think in this situation, goes, okay, I just came from Athens. I know what it's like to, to have to debate, and I know what it's like to, to have to discuss and, and persuade. So, okay, God, I got it. For I am with you, he says. No one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So God was speaking to Paul saying, I've got your back. I've got your back. I've got a plan for this city. And I'm going to walk with you in this plan. You keep going, Paul. Don't be afraid. So Paul stayed in Corinth a year and a half or so, teaching them the word of God. You see, Paul was being led by the Spirit. He listened to Holy Spirit. He walked by faith. And as he walked by faith, God opened new doors for him. And he stepped into those doors. I encourage you, if you're facing adversity in something, and a door is not opening, a door is not opening, and you've been praying, get some more counsel. Okay? I'm not saying give up. I'm saying get counsel. Because if the door is not opening, and you've been praying, and you know God is speaking to you, maybe you're missing something. Don't take a journey on your own. Have people around you that can speak into you. Now, Paul had just had Timothy and Silas come to join him. The neat thing about Timothy and Silas coming to join Paul is that when they came, they came from um, 
Philippi. And when he came from Philippi, the Philippi church had sent Paul a financial blessing so that he didn't then have to work with Priscilla and Aquila. He didn't have to do two jobs at once. He could focus on one thing, which was the gospel. The church in Philippi had sent him a great offering, and he was able just to move forward and focus on the gospel. And, and he knew, okay, God is opening these doors, and I'm keeping going. If everything you're trying to do, the door is not opening, you need to reevaluate what you're doing. You need counsel. And allow someone else to pray with you and speak into it. Don't keep kicking against closed doors. I know this might, might not sound like a faith part of life, but you might just need to make a change. And when you make a change, that might be when God opens the door. You see, when we were planting that church, we were going on Saturday nights and we were putting all of our energy into it. And it was awesome, but we knew if we were really going to reach the community, we needed to go to Sunday morning. And when we made the change, the church began to grow. And we began to see God do phenomenal things in people's lives. But it was because of the change we made. Sometimes you're going to have to make a change. Even when you're being led by the Spirit, the Lord will take you in one direction for so long. Paul had to make a change. Paul had to move from the synagogue to next door to reach the Gentiles. When one door closed, he didn't keep kicking against it. He moved next door. You might need to do that when you're facing adversity. Proverbs chapter 3 tells us this, trust in the Lord and with all your heart, lean on not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. In other words, he'll, he'll, he'll straighten it out so it doesn't seem like you're going back and forth. He will make a direction for you. And the easiest way to get from point A to point B is straight. And that's what God does when we listen to him. But sometimes we have to be able to make the adjustment in life. Be led by the spirit and rest in his peace. This is something I think that Paul learned because we do read this later on in, in Paul's writings. He says, you know, I've, I've learned to be content in all circumstances. I've, I know what it is to, to have everything I need and I know what it is to be in lack, but I've learned to be content in every circumstance. And rest in his peace. Paul writes to the Philippian church and he tells them, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. A prayer and thanksgiving. God, I thank you. You put me in this mess. <laughs> Isn't that a great prayer to have to pray? God, I, I, I'm so thankful that I'm facing adversity right now. Because I know you're building character in me. I, I know you're building perseverance in me. I, I know you're moving. You're teaching me things in the middle of this pain. In every circumstance. Every circumstance. He doesn't say in the good circumstances. He says in every circumstance. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. I can remember with Andrea, and we'd be praying at the altar of the church that we had just built. And, and as we're praying, you know, and in some, sometimes it was with a broken heart that we had poured everything into this and we had not seen the traction that we expected to see and we were facing this adversity because we knew we were doing what the holy spirit was telling to telling us to do and what our council had been telling us to do but it was it was a challenge to do and when we face that adversity i can remember being at the altar and, and praying and saying okay god i thank you this is the time of my life I got more challenge than I can face on my own. Uh, I, you, you have to know me to understand that. I love a challenge. No matter how hard it is, I will not give up until I've overcome the challenge. So I was home visiting my parents this last couple of weeks. Uh, we flew out on uh, Monday previous, not this past Monday, Monday before. We got stuck in Montreal. As soon as I got off that plane in Montreal, uh, heading towards Moncton, um, I looked at my app, and it said, flight canceled. And I looked at Brielle, because Brielle was flying with me, and, and Kristen was flying with Andrea. Brielle, or Andrea and Kristen went through Toronto, because uh, of the way the flights worked out, and, and Brielle and I went through Montreal. And as we're going through Montreal, 
long story short, we get stuck there. I look at my app. It says, I'm going to get to Moncton 68 hours from now. I had a 68-hour layover. I'm like, okay, this is ridiculous. So I grabbed Brielle and said, come on, we got to beat everybody else that's on this plane to the stand because obviously there is a mess in Montreal. So we get to the uh, uh, stand where you can talk to the customer service. And uh, fortunately, we, we had priority, so we, we get in the priority line. There's like four families in front of me on the priority line. It took us one hour and ten minutes to move four spaces. The other line went down the quarter. We get up there, and I look at the guy. I said, you having fun? And he looked at me, and he, said, he smiled. He said, oh, yeah, this is, this is a nightmare. And while I'm standing there, the, the whoever ups call him, and he picks up the phone, and, and they tell him actually to close the line and send everybody somewhere else. And he, he just said, man, I can't do that. You need to get security down here for me to do that. He literally said that, and I looked at him. I said, what do you got to do? He said, I got to close the line. I'm like, oh, dude, just finish mine first. <laughs> I've been in this line an hour and a half. We only moved four people or an hour and 10 minutes. So anyway, we get to the front, and uh, I just look at him and say, listen, I don't care. Get me anywhere in the Maritimes. My brother will come pick me up. It doesn't matter. Every, every other airport's about an hour and a half to two hours from Moncton. Anywhere in the Maritimes, Halifax, I don't care. He said, really? I said, yeah, I don't care. Wherever you can get me, just get me there. He said, all right, I can get you on a Halifax flight tomorrow morning. Like, Great, we'll take it. So we end up getting there. Luggage gets there a couple days later. I'm there with my parents until uh, Sunday with Andrea and the girls. Andrea and the girls leave on Sunday. And so on, on Monday, I'm doing some work around my parents' house for them. I stayed to do some work. And on Tuesday, my mom says to me, she says, oh, I have a new toilet downstairs that I want you to put in the bathroom. And I said, okay, uh, no problem. That's it's a pretty simple job, typically. So you just take one off, put one on. I've done it lots. And uh, so I go downstairs and I get in. It's one of those higher ones, so it's, it's just incredibly heavy. But it's a little bit bigger, so it's easier for them to get up. And uh, so I take it. The old one off, take it outside, put the new one on, hook it all up like I've done numerous other times, flush it, seems okay, flush it again, seems okay, go downstairs because the ceiling's open under that one because it's right above the utility room, and, and I go downstairs, and I tell mom, flush it again. She flushes, and all of a sudden, I see water dripping. I'm like, oh, no, I, I did it right. Oh, I must have met. So I go up, take it off clean around it again. The flange, if you know, but, but anyways, the, where it sits on, it's called a flange. It was a little bit crooked, so it was sitting like this, and the water was coming out the back, so I thought, maybe that flange is wrong. But I put a new seal on it, put it back on again, flushed it a few more times. It's leaking. I'm like, oh, that stupid flange. I got to fix that flange. So I cut out all the piping from the main drain back to the toilet and replumb it all back in there, get that flange nice and perfectly straight. I go get some more wax seal, put it on, put that thing back on. These things are heavy. Like, they're very heavy, especially the big ones. Anyway, put it on. I think it's got to be perfect. Go downstairs, flush it. Mom flushes it. Mm, looks good. Flush it. Flushes again, starts leaking again. I'm like, oh my goodness, I did it right. And then I thought, well, I better check YouTube. So I YouTubed it, <laughs> made sure everything was right, went and got another wax seal, put it back on there again. I thought, Mom, I still have that wax seal on wrong. Put it back on there again, leaks again. At that point, I'm just getting mad, but I'm not giving up. It's already been six hours. So, Mom and we were supposed to go out for supper, so we go out for supper, <clears throat> come home. I say, listen, I'll get to this in the morning. I have to use the bathroom downstairs, so I get to it in the morning again. I take it off and do it again and everything. And I, finally, I put it back on again. And Oh, I go to, no, I go to lunch with a friend of mine. I, I did it again in the morning. still didn't work. I'm out of wax seals. Mom's gone out with a friend of hers. A friend of mine, comes, old high school friend, comes to pick me up. We go out to lunch. His brother's a plumber. So I take a bunch of pictures of it and send it to his brother. And his brother said, hey, it looks right to me. There's nothing wrong with what you did. Everything's like, okay. So anyway, I, we stop at Home Depot on the way after lunch. I pick up two more flanges. And I go back home. I switch it again. Or not a flange. I put another wax seal. And put another wax seal on it. Flush it again. It leaks again. At this point, I pick it up, I put it back in the box, and as I'm putting it in the box, I realize there's a crack in the base of the toilet. So it wasn't the installer. <laughs> so I go back outside and pick up the toilet that's outside and bring it inside and put it on the toilet, and, and of course, it works perfect. I don't give up on anything. I mean, I just, I just don't give up. But sometimes... 
you have to change course. And when you're facing adversity, get some counsel. <laughs> if the door's not opening, if there's still a leak, get some counsel and change course. And when I changed course, of course, it worked fine. Uh, and I told them, next time I come home, I'll go buy a new one and, and install it again. But Paul, in this circumstance, he faces adversity and he keeps going. He gets those around him and they go with him. God opens a new door. And then something amazing happens in this scripture that you wouldn't know unless you research this a little bit more. You see, sometimes you've got to give God space to respond on your behalf. Sometimes we're so eager to jump in and defend ourselves. We're so eager to jump in and, and just make it happen. If you're like me, you don't give up on anything, and you will do anything you can to make it happen. And I can see Paul in this place. Now, what's happened is the, the, the synagogue ruler has, has changed, as I mentioned, and, and they begin to rise up against Paul, and they actually take him to the proconsul. And when they take him to the proconsul, they bring these accusations against him. And long story short, the proconsul just looks at them and says, well, if you were bringing them to me about some misdemeanor, misdemeanor the thing that he had done, or, or some law that he had broken, I would make a ruling against this. But Paul doesn't have to say a word. Paul's ready to defend himself. And the pro stands up and says, I'm not going to deal with your infighting because this hasn't got anything to do with me. And as he does that, then he dismisses the case. But if the pro had have said, okay, I side with the synagogue rulers over Paul, Paul would have been shut down for the rest of his ministry. Because then it would have become Roman law. And he would not have been able to move forward. But because this was a God thing. There was nothing that could stop what God was doing. And God knew what Satan was up to. See sometimes we look at things on the surface. And we look at them and go man, I, I just don't understand this. And, and we just keep going and going and going. And then all of a sudden, God steps into the circumstance. And when God steps into the circumstance, you know it's God. Because when he steps in, he changes the game completely. But you've got to be, you've got to be listening to his voice. You've got to be led by his spirit. He goes on, he says, but because this was involves questions about your theology, basically, he says, deal with it yourself. And he drove them off. And then the individuals j jump them and, and beat them up. See, God works on your behalf, even when you don't expect him to. But I believe that in all circumstance, with prayer and thanksgiving, when we come to God with our circumstances, that's when he shows up in a big way. So if you're facing adversity, if you're facing adversity, you got to know when to speak and when to stay silent. You've got to give God space in the circumstance. You got to give God space to show up. If you're doing your part, I, I, I love it in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 4, verse 14, where, when God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will. Then I will. I will respond to the prayers offered in this place. I will hear from heaven and I will move. I love that because it's a confidence that we can take in our own lives that, okay, God, I'm listening to your voice. I'm moving forward in faith. Uh, I see the open door. I'm stepping through the open door. Uh, I'm facing opposition. I'm facing difficulties. I'm facing whatever it is. I'm being obedient to you. I'm praying. I'm seeking counsel. But I need you to show up. And when God shows up, not only does it open up Corinth for him, but it actually continues to open the entire Roman Empire for the gospel of Jesus. 
Because if he could have gotten, if, the, if, if Satan could have orchestrated for the proconsul to listen to the synagogue ruler, which would happen often, it could have shut down Christianity. It could have made it illegal. But it stayed under a sect of Judaism which was legal in the Roman Empire. And God used that to take the gospel forward. Sometimes we don't know what God is doing. And sometimes we got to go through opposition in order for God to open new doors. And when Paul left there, he was able to keep going because he had already had a ruling from the proconsul that this was just a Jewish matter. It had nothing to do with the Roman Empire. And God opened bigger doors through this one incident in Corinth that opened up and gave Paul favor everywhere else. No matter what it is you're going through right now, you might be facing adversity. This could be the thing that God's going to use to open up something greater. Or it could be just a step to go through a new door. Whatever it is, just be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit and what he's fa saying to you. When facing adversity, have courage to go forward. Look for the open door. If God's got another door open for you, pray about it. And if this is the door to step through, step through that door. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Rest in his peace. Let the peace of God that, that doesn't make sense be yours because you're taking the time just to stop and pray and rejoice in who he is and what he can do in your life and give God space. Don't be that person that's just got to make it happen. Don't be like that bulldog that won't let go of a bone. Jump in there and allow Holy Spirit to direct you and be moldable and, and movable and keep moving forward. But give God space to respond on your behalf. Don't always be defending yourself. Don't speak first. One thing I've learned in leadership is listen more or as much as you speak. At least as much, preferably more. And when you listen, God begins to speak in the middle of things like you could never speak. And when he gives those words of wisdom to you, then you're able to unload that or unpack that. You'll look at that when you look at Athens next week where Paul gets up and he defends the gospel. And I imagine Paul was ready to do that in this circumstance. He had just done it in Athens. So he had rehearsed it in his mind. He was ready to do it. But Paul could not do it as good as God. And God steps in, speaks to the proconsul, and the proconsul dismisses the charges. So Holy Spirit, truly give his ears to hear what you are saying to us when we're facing adversity. Holy Spirit, speak loudly into our lives. And may we not be so stubborn that we won't make directional changes. God, may we be moldable and directable by your Spirit. And Lord, show us what it is that you want us to take out of this, this weekend. Lord, if there's someone here facing adversity and Lord, they're just pushing, pushing, pushing. Help them to stop for a moment. In the middle of it all, focus on you again. Allow you to speak loudly into their life. And Holy Spirit, just give them that faith to take the next step that you want them to take. As Ben and Michaela lead us in the song, just listen to Holy Spirit and what he might be saying to you this weekend. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Cause your name is power Healing
Father, there's things in our lives that, <clears throat> that might be adversity to us, Lord, that we've been facing over and over again, maybe in a spiritual context where we do need that freedom, that, Lord, you want to shine your light into those things. So give us a sensitivity to listen to your spirit. Lord, when we're facing adversity somewhere else, Lord, that you want to work in that circumstance to open new doors. God, give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us and wisdom father to take the steps that you show us we should take and father for anyone here or watching online this weekend father that man they're just up against something and they've been crying out to you lord i, I just pray in this moment that your peace that is not natural to us will just flood their life and Lord, as your peace floods their life, that you will help them then to be able to look in another direction, to see what it is that you want to do or the solution that you have for the situation. And Lord, for those this weekend that are watching or in this room that don't have that relationship with you, that would give them that guidance, that would give them, Father, that, that voice in their life that when they face adversity, they have somebody else working on their behalf. Lord, I, I pray for that individual right now, that they would be sensitive to the voice of your Spirit, just speaking to them, convicting them of where they're at in life and their need for you. So, Father, if there's anyone in the sound of my voice that doesn't have relationship with you, just speak spirit to spirit to them right now. Convict them where they need conviction about their relationship or non-relationship with you. Show them your love. And show them your grace. And with your heads bowed and eyes closed, just listen to the Holy Spirit as he's speaking to you this weekend whether it's online or in this room, and if you'd be here and you'd say, you know what, I need Jesus in my life. I'm, I'm facing difficulties on my own. I'm living my life by myself. And you know, I want God in my life, directing my life. I want to give you an opportunity just to simply pray a prayer with me that would invite him in and make that surrender to him of, God, here's my life. Use it as you see fit. If that's you this weekend, just before I lead you in this prayer, I just ask you to look at me across this room. I'm going to look from my right and your left and online. There'll be a little thing that comes up and just say, I want to receive Jesus. Just click on that and let us know that you're praying this prayer with us this weekend. If that's you and you're here and you'd like to just say, Jesus, I need you in my life. Just look at me in my right and your left. And in the middle, if that's you this weekend, my left and your right. Amen. Right there in your seat and right there at home, just pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me my sin. Fill me with your Spirit. And God, direct my life. I give you my life. Help me to overcome the adversities that I've been facing and walk in the direction that you have for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and let's sing this as we close. I speak the name of Jesus.
function in our life. We thank you that in Jesus' name, Lord, we do have authority over the circumstances that come our way. And Father, I just pray this week, as we do face adversity, and we bring it to you, that Lord, you will open new doors. And God, you will direct our steps. In Jesus' name. I got, I got some. I got a praise report that this is just awesome because I, I was flying across Canada, of course, last week, going to my parents, and that was a nightmare. But coming back, all my flights were on time, which was cool. Thank you, Lord. And when they tagged in my my luggage, when I got to the thing, uh, when they tagged my luggage in, I walked up, and the lady that was standing, I looked, there was two ladies there. I said, uh, who do I go? And she said, one lady said, oh, come to me, Pastor Mark. And the other lady said, just come up. And I was like, you know me? And uh, the lady said, yeah, I was in your young adults group in Edmonton. Uh, that was like 20 some years ago. <clears throat> so that was cool. That gave me favor. And my seats were awesome. And uh, yeah, it was awesome. And when I got off here in, in, in Calgary, after we finally got in, because we flew in, I flew in Thursday when that storm was going on, uh, waiting for my luggage to come in. When my luggage came out, there was not a tag on it anywhere. But it got to Calgary. So thank you, Lord. You see, God is good. Even in the little things, God is good. I don't know where that tag left, but I don't care. It, it just, it got here. So uh, thank you, Lord. So no matter what you're going through, God's got it. God's got it. And just have faith in Him and just keep moving forward. And He will direct your step. And He will make your path straight and work it all out. We'd love to pray with you. If there's anything you're going through that we can pray with you, our ministry team is going to be here at the front. God bless you. Have a great week.